Hi everybody, welcome to week 12 of our graduate statistics course at the University of Cincinnati. We've come a long way already, and believe it or not, only two uh, lectures until the end of the year. So hang in there, we're almost done. And we've covered a lot of ground. So we've done a lot of work in terms of helping you understand the process of, of organizing, exploring, and describing your data using numerical summaries and visuals. Then I introduced you to the logic and the theory and the process behind testing hypotheses because every time we are looking at data, we want to really use it to make inferences about what goes on in the population, right, of interest. So because we're sampling from that population, we're always subjected to potential sampling error. Not every time that we sample, we'll get exactly the same results. So how do we know if the results we're getting are robust enough for us to, you know, assume that there's something going on, that we can reject the null hypothesis, that nothing is going on in terms of differences between means, in terms of biases in distributions of categorical variables, like we've seen last uh, week, or in terms of whether or not two categorical variables are dependent or independent from each other. So we've applied that process in, uh, you know, to solve and answer questions of a variety of sorts. So I'll repeat again, we learned how to apply statistical methods to test hypotheses about differences between means. Um, we applied these methods to discover whether there is biases in the distribution of categorical variables. Um, like we've done last time, we asked, for instance, if there is a bias in um, in the distribution of victims of police shootings by race. Um, we used chi-square for good, goodness of fit to answer questions of this sort. We also used chi-square to test whether two variables are, two categorical variables are dependent or independent of each other. So you can think about things like are you know decisions about the death penalty once somebody's convicted related to somebody's race so those are two categorical variables because the decisions to uh convict to to sentence somebody to the death penalty is a yes to no uh, type of variable so it's categorical and the race of a person is also categorical right either a person is latino or hispanic or i mean race and ethnicity here together um Either the person's Latina or Hispanic or white or black or of indigenous origin. So all of those are, um, are categories of race, right? So we learned how to determine whether two categorical variables are or not dependent on each other and influencing each other using chi-square. So today we'll continue to apply the same logic of statistical data analysis, both descriptive and and um, an inferential in order to determine if two variables are correlated with each other. Now we're moving beyond just categorical variables and whether we can model that relationship using linear regression. So moving a little bit beyond just describing a correlation and its strength, whether it's there or not, to actually characterizing more carefully and modeling that relationship with linear regression. So let's get started. So let's start as usual with a problem, poverty and education. So is there a relationship between poverty, let's think of poverty as our response variable, and high school graduation rate? So is the amount of poverty in a particular location related to the percentage of people that graduate from high school, right? So the percentage of graduation rate um, or the graduation rate would be a an explanatory variable in this context, in the context of this problem, or a candidate explanatory variable for poverty in a given location. So we'll look at data from 50 states plus Washington, D.C. So this is real data from the United States. Uh, the poverty line um, is any income below 23,050 for a family of four, and that's data and, and criteria um, established and valid for 2012. I'm not sure if it's quite the same now. Might have changed a bit. Um, but this is sort of the context 
uh, for looking at the data that we will present here. So here is the real data. So we want to make inferences about this relationship in the United States. So we have data sampled from um, all 50 states. So here we have the explanatory variable, which we put whatever whatever variable we pick to be our explanatory variable in our problem, we're going to put in the x-axis. This is important when we're plotting scatter plots. And the variable that we wish to explain here, poverty, is in the y-axis. So the data measures the percentage of people that graduated from high school in a particular state, of course, a sample um, of locations in that state. What's the percentage of people that graduate from high school? And what's the percentage of poverty in that same region? Okay, so you can imagine this dot being one of the states. And then we have a particular value for percentage of graduation and a particular value for poverty. Okay, so each dot is an independent kind of state in the data set. So again, the response variable is percent in, in, um, in poverty, which we put in the y-axis. And the explanatory variable is the percentage of high school graduates in that same location. And we put that variable in the x-axis. And then the relationship is what we want to characterize. And by looking at the scatter plot, we can see a couple of things. First, we can, if we kind of think and abstract, imagine that there is, it looks like we can fit a line to describe this relationship, right? A, dis, a line that looks like this. And it has this, this slope that goes this way, kind of a negative slope versus a positive slope like this. And a negative slope indicates um, an inverse relationship. And we can sort of see that because the higher values of poverty are related to lower values of uh, high school graduates. So it's a negative relationship. And it's moderately strong because if we can imagine a line um, crossing these da this data cloud, the data cloud is not too far away from it. A lot of the points would be very close to this line, right? So we would say that this distribution of dots looks like a more um, moderately strong relationship. If you're thinking, how would you know that? Well, this is experience in looking at data, and I'll provide you with a little bit of that using some fake data in the lab where I vary the strength so you can see how the cloud shapes up when you, when you have values that are, that are suggestive of moderate relationships, strong relationships, and so on and so forth, okay? Um, but the idea is that when we do correlation analysis, we're after describing the strength of the linear association between two variables. So the scatter plot is telling us that it's linear looking, that it's negative, and we do correlation analysis to kind of get a value, a numerical value that is estimates the strength of that relationship uh, so we, that we don't have to count in our eyes to determine that. Though, you know, with practice, you start looking at a scatter plot and thinking, ooh, this, this looks like a pretty strong relationship or uh, it seems to be there but kind of weak. But you don't have to count on your eyes only because you can actually estimate a, uh, a value, a correlation coefficient that describes the strength of the linear relationship that is displayed in a scatter plot. And that correlation is denoted typically R. Look at this. Correlation property, strength of association. If you can imagine a line cutting through the dots in a scatter plot, if you see that the dots would be tightly close to the dot, this would be an extremely strong linear and positive relationship because as the value of one variable goes up, the, the values of the other variable also goes up. As the value of one variable goes down, the value of the other variable goes down as well. So that's a positive relationship contrasting with this one, that is sort of a negative relationship because when the value of one variable goes up, it's related to lower values of the other variable. So this again would be a moderately moderate to strong relationship because now you have more spread around an imaginary line cutting across this data cloud. And here would be, you know, pretty much no relationship. 
So if, if you were to estimate the R, the co correlation coefficient for these scatter plots, this would be on the, you know, on the 90s, very high. This would be on the 60s, kind of moderate range, right? Somewhere, you know, between 60 and 80 are typically considered moderate. The closer to 80, the stronger, the closer to 60, the weaker it is, but moderate sized. And this is sort of almost no correlation. You see that it looks more like a, instead of looking like a shaped like a cylinder, it starts being shaped more like a, like a circle. You know that the correlation is sort of disappearing, right? Because you can begin to see that a variety of values of the x variable leads to very similar values of the y variable, which means that they are not covariant. They're not varying together, okay? So this would be then, again, a positive relationship, and this would be a negative relationship. And when we estimate um, correlation coefficients, we get a sign that indicates the direction. So this is a very strong relationship and positive, and this is a very strong relationship and negative. You can see that this is a little bit lower than this, and that's reflected in the sort of the width of those um, of the data cloud. You see that here it's more narrow, which would indicate less, less deviation from an imaginary line here in the middle, and here a little bit thicker, but still pretty strong. Okay. So how do we compute R? So this is the formula, and we will not compute this by hand. We'll have a, a function in R that will compute the R coefficient for us. <laughs> um, that's confusing. But a function in our R Studio cloud that will compute the R coefficient, the correlation coefficient R for us. But I want to kind of give you the architecture of that of that computation. And all you need to know is that here on the numerator, we compute how much the two variables vary together. That's the covariance between the two, okay? And on the denominator, we put how much they vary alone. If the, the proportion of variation can be attributed to variation that happens together, in comparison to how much they vary sort of independent from each other, then we have a higher R coefficient. So that's the logic. The R coefficient is telling us the strength of how much they vary, two variables vary together with respect to how much they are varying sort of without influencing each other. And the correlation coefficient is always between negative one, which, be, which would be a perfect negative linear association, like all points would follow straight into a line and one would be a perfect a negative one would be a perfect negative linear association should be pointing to this graph uh, coefficient of one would be a perfect positive correlation so all points would follow in the line not around it um, and a coefficient of zero would be no association at all and remember expecting a correlation of zero in the population would be typically the null hypothesis, right? So given what we've discussed so far, let's start practicing uh, your sense of interpretation of scatter plots, which are plots that display the relationship between variables. Remember, you were introduced to those in lab four, but now we're digging into actually doing analysis and testing hypotheses that uh, follow from what we observe on these plots, right? So look at this plot that, that is displaying real data relating the, the percentage of poverty in a, in a location with the percentage of high school graduates. And try to pick which would be the correlation coefficient out of these options. What is a feasible, a result that would not surprise you if R were to spit out for you? when you ask for a correlation coefficient to describe the correlation that we're seeing in this plot. Take a minute. Pause the video and I'll come back. All right. So if you are starting to look at this, the first thing you can ask yourself before even thinking about the strength, think about if it is a positive or a negative relationship. Because the slope is going from 
left to right like this, not from right to left. It's kind of dropping from left to right. Uh, we say it's a negative relationship. Why? Because lower values of high school graduation are related to higher values of poverty. So as the amount of as the amount of high school graduates goes up, the amount of poverty goes down. So it's a negative relationship. So that already eliminates A and D as possible answers. Now, because we're in the realm of negatives, we also know that R values, correlation coefficients, go from negative one to one. So that should eliminate alternative E. So we're left with B, which indicates a, mo a you know a moderate to strong um, correlation, and a negative point one, which would be a very weak correlation. So if you imagine this line cutting across the cloud of data, you can see that there is lots and lots of points really close to it, some kind of deviating from it, but it's not awful, right? It doesn't look it looks more like a cylinder than it looks like a kind of a circle. So you should be guessing a higher, something that's higher than something that's close to zero, right? So B would be a better, the best alternative here, all right? So this is correlation. We'll come back in a bit uh, to understand how we would test hypotheses uh, about uh, correlations, okay? We'll see you soon.